Welcome to Measuring Success Right, the official podcast of the Marriott Student Review, a podcast for students by students, where we connect the leaders of tomorrow with the issues of today. Welcome back, guys, to Measuring Success Right. Today we have a special guest, Taz Murray, with us, who is the co-founder of Trufu, Trufu, and also the co-founder of Dynamic Confections. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Appreciate you inviting me. So today I want to talk a little bit about your background in business. You were the co-founder of Dynamic Confections and you spent 23 years doing that. Is that right? Correct. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got started and what that was all about? Sure. I had graduated from business school, was working in consulting during the um, Rodney King riots, something that you guys probably have really no idea of, but <laughs> it was pretty traumatic. And uh, I, wasn't, I was traveling a lot in consulting, so I was looking for a business to buy. Ended up buying a company. Uh, long story short, I ended up buying a company in Salt Lake by the name of Maxfield Candy, and then we expanded that into um, Alpine Confections, which included um, a a company called Ken Craft in Alpine, a company called Dynamic Chocolates in uh, BC, Canada, a company called uh, Harry London Chocolates in Canton, Ohio, and then uh, our flagship brand was Fannie Mae Chocolates in uh, the Chicagoland area. So they were a a retail destination store um, uh, just like I think we had sixty-five stores when we, we were running it. So what were you? What would you do day to day? Just all so different. So there was. I had a. I was fortunate to have a very good business partner by the name of D- Dave Tacklett. We met in business school. Uh, he was a great Notre Dame kid. I've always said he's a better Catholic than I am a Mormon, but um, <laughs> he's just a great, great. Really fortunate to have him as a business partner. Very bright. Very driven understood the market. We worked really well together. We complemented each other pretty well. Um, so we ended up um, just growing that together, and we, we were we sort of co-presidents, which is kind of weird. But it worked out well for us. I don't think I would recommend it for everybody, but it worked out really well for us. We divided our companies by, uh, I guess you would say, the candy snobs and then the blue-collar candy people, and I was the blue candy blue collar candy guy and he was the candy snob <laughs> so he had the destination retail stores plus sold to anybody above target and above i sold and managed all the business from below target so that would include as you would expect walmart and uh, grocery stores and um uh, c stores and stuff like that wow so that's how we divided it and we ended up doing really well i mean we ended up Growing the company and selling it, so uh, you know that was a great that was a great outcome. Um, didn't intend that intend that for, for that to happen, but we grew it to be a, a pretty good size. We were, I think, the tenth lar- the top ten largest candy manufacturers in North America. So we were pretty proud of that. But it sounds a lot better than it was because once you get beyond Mars, Hershey, and Nestle, there's not a lot left. But uh, you know, there's a few big, pretty big ones. So we felt like we were doing pretty good. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Well, at what point and why did you decide to sell? Uh, we'd been doing it for about 15 years, and we'd always said we'd maybe look around when we hit 100 million in sales, which we which we surpassed. And um, at that point, we sort of said, well, let's check the market. And then uh, we got a, a couple of offers that we were very impressive. So we kind of walked away from it and kind of said, hey, we're, let's just keep going. And then uh, one of the suitors was uh, 1-800-Flowers, a public company, and they really wanted uh, a candy company, a candy uh, line that they could sell online. So they came back to us and ended up um, making a pretty compelling offer. And so we ended up selling the company then. Selling That's them. cool. At that point, had you already decided you wanted to start another business? Which, no, 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 I was retired. Okay. Happily retired, donating all my time. <laughs> Not getting paid anything, but it was nice. It was right. kind of a comfortable lifestyle. So I think I was a little too young to retire. So I, I think at some point I started to get a little restless. But after, okay. I, yeah, I, I lasted a good five years. How old were you when you retired? 50. Okay. So then you spent five years just doing... Coaching football, coaching football. volunteering, every kind of volunteer service known mm-hmm. to man. And uh, enjoyed it. Uh, right. Played a lot of golf. Tammy and I got to know each other a little bit again, my wife. 
and we had fun golfing together, and I got to know my kids a little bit. Coached football for a while, and that was fun because I had two boys playing at the time. I didn't coach them. I was specifically not going to coach my own kids, but I coached other positions on the team. Right. So that was nice. That fun. is really cool. Yeah. And then at what point did you – how did True Fruit come about? Uh, we were introduced by uh, – by the lowly, the honorable Dan Snow, who's the, uh, he's leads the MBA program at BYU. And his brother-in-law had sold his business. He knew I'd retired and come from the chocolate business. His brother-in-law was a guy named Brian Neville who had sold his companies and wanted to do something with freeze-dried fruit and coated in chocolate. So he was pretty excited about that. I, I That was a pretty easy thing to help him with. So... Um, you know, we kind of got together, looked at it. He, I got him started, at, you know, making uh, chocolate-coated freeze-dried fruit. We kind of did that together, and it was kind of a fun project. But um, for me, it was like that's a good base hit. It's not a home run. It's, it's a niche product that appealed to a certain group of people that liked freeze-dried fruit and freeze-dried product, but it didn't appeal to the mass. It wasn't a, a, a broad offering. So we started just talking about it and we came across this idea of uh, maybe we should do a frozen fruit coated in chocolate. So we started to investigate that and then that's when we came up with, we started dipping all kinds of frozen fruit and trying to figure out how to do it and finally came up with this uh, idea for true fruit, uh, the frozen fruit side. So true fruit is now comprised of freeze-dried fruit coated in chocolate and frozen fruit coated in chocolate. And are the frozen ones more popular, yes. would you say? Yeah, yeah, they took off like gangbusters. <laughs> yeah, that was good. So I've tried a lot of the true fruit. I think it's so good. I like ate Thank the you. whole pack at one, one night. So I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> defeats the point of it being 90 calories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a handful. <laughs> 90 know. calories, is, it's intended to be a treat, not a meal. I know. Did your background in chocolate really help with in this case? Yes. Then? Yeah. In this case, it did help a lot because we were doing something in, with chocolate that hadn't been done. Right. In fact, all the <laughs> so you're taking a frozen, basically ice cube, and coating it in chocolate, or you're taking fresh fruit and coating it in chocolate. Either way, it's ninety percent water, and in the world of chocolate, water and chocolate do not mix. Mm -hmm. So I was told over and over again by anybody that I talked to in the industry, you can't, you can't do that. And then when we went to somebody to help manufacture it, they said, I have no interest in helping you with that because we're going to have a mess on our hands. If something goes wrong with a line, you got fruit in the line and it's going to get mixed with the chocolate, you're going to have a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So no one, no one would do it. But anyway, that's... That helped a lot to kind of get over overcome yeah. some of those hurdles because I, I kind of knew what chocolate could do and I kind of knew what uh, chocolate machinery could do. Right. And I kind of I think uh, Brian and I figured it out together on hey I think we can make this yeah. work. So that's probably why no one had done that before. Yeah. So uh, who did you get to do it? How did you overcome that? A couple of BYU students um, had graduated from BYU, and I had, they'd actually come and interview me when I was running Maxfield Candy and, uh, and Dynamic Chocolates and Alpine Confections. And they, uh, I told them never to go into the chocolate industry, and they, were, they, they, like everybody, doesn't listen to my advice. They went right into the chocolate industry and did great. So uh, uh, they started a company called Mrs. Calls up in Heber, and they were very nice to let us in and come in and uh, start making our product in their plant. So we worked out a deal with them, and uh, very kind, really, honestly. I don't think I would have done it in my own plant, but they were nice enough to let us in. We got started, um, kind of outgrew them pretty quick. Uh, so we ended up uh, moving our production outside of Utah. So now we have production in the state of Washington, in Ohio, in uh, Poland, and in California. Wow, that's so cool. So. If they said you couldn't do it, how how have you done it? Like, did you just, you know what I'm saying? Is that a secret? Yeah, no, yeah it is kind of a secret, so I'm not going to tell okay, you much you about it. Other than <laughs> it worked. I mean, it was, and it was, it was uh, kind of a lesson in not, not believing what everybody tells you, right? Right. It's kind of a lesson in, I think I can make this work if I can figure out. There were some technical things that I didn't understand. Uh, one of them was dipping chocolate in liquid nitrogen. So I actually went, we 
got liquid nitrogen and dipped chocolate in it. Wow. And, uh, you know, what happens is it's so cold. I thought it would fracture the chocolate and do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, but the chocolate came out really actually almost perfect, but it's so cold that it immediately attracts uh, condensation on it. So it's not perfect. Uh -huh. But it was interesting to see that, okay, well, the chocolate can hold up, so i got to figure out some other stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. And uh, I think Brian was, you know, he, he is a driven guy, so he was driven enough to say, hey, let's, we'll make some mistakes, but let's go ahead and try this. Mm -hmm. So we bought a bunch of equipment and started putting it together. And some of the equipment didn't even work. I mean, we still still in a warehouse somewhere. We <laughs> probably need to get rid of it at some point. But, <laughs> Um, you know, the stuff that did work has worked, and we've proven it will work, and we've expanded it and replicated it, and now we're making custom-made lines that uh, fit exactly what we need to do and working great. That's so cool. In spite of what all the incumbents say. Right. And then at what point did you call vendors? Like, how did you get it on the market? Right. So we started with the freeze-dried product. We did that for about six months. And we call it hyper-dried because it's so dry, it's crunchy. I don't know if you, the difference between dehydrated and freeze-dried right. is just freeze-dried retains its color and its flavor and its uh, size and all its nutrition. Where a dehydrated is cooked, so it cooks all the sugars together and the flavor kind of becomes blended. So, you know, a, a raisin tastes like a cherry that tastes like a rat. I mean, anything mm -hmm. that's dehydrated kind of tastes alike. So... Uh, that was the benefit of the hyper dried product. So we started coding that and selling that, and we just called on local customers. Like, I think we started. I think I, my first, our first sell was to. Oh, I'm going to forget the name, and this is terrible. But they're a, a store down in Payson, mm -hmm. a grocery store. So I mean, that was like our first sell, and then we kind of went to Associated Foods, and then we went to Harmons, and um, we just expanded kind of slowly from there just to see how it would work. Um, frozen was a little different, but that's kind of how we got started. We got a little bit of a base. We went to the military. The military liked the product right away and started putting it in yeah. all the military stores. Wow, that's so that's so amazing because I know I noticed that Walmart just started. Yeah. Didn't Walmart just start doing it just now? They did because whenever I'd go and try and find some, I could only find them in certain places. Yeah. Why didn't Walmart like? originally go with it? Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, in the industry, there are leaders, people that will take chances and lead and, and seek innovation. I think uh, Target's more on that side in the mass class of trade. There's in the grocery class of trade. Harmons is that way. You know, a company like Wegmans. Uh, hy V. there's grocery stores throughout the country that are very Smart and Final in L.A., they sort of like to do innovation. There's other grocery stores who want to let it get proven first and don't want to take any risks or take as many risks. I mean, they're all taking risks, right? And so some of the other ones don't want to lead that quickly. So they're a little bit more of a, maybe, you know, they just like to have a proven success before they put it in their stores. Well, that makes sense. And uh, Walmart can be innovative when they want to be, and they can be, uh, you know, they can be a good follower when they want to be too so in our case it worked out to be that they you know we just I think we've been in business now for four years and I think we're just now going into Walmart Walmart is almost anybody that's in the consumer products business has to at some point sell Walmart but it's a tricky thing <laughs> yeah selling Walmart as you would guess because Walmart is everywhere they're big one way or another right. And they can destroy you, and they can make you, and they can do all kinds of good things, and they can do all kinds <laughs> of good things. So it's one of those things. I mean, we love Walmart, so we're so happy to be in there. Yeah. Because you mentioned you have a warehouse in Europe, did you say? We uh, have I a manufacturing plant in Poland. Yeah. In Poland. Mm -hmm. So is True Fruit in, like, England? Uh, we did a we did a in and out through uh, Costco. Oh, in, yeah. In the UK, but we haven't sold permanent. Okay. So far, we're importing most of the product from Poland into the U.S. Oh, okay. Makes into sense. Into North America. We're consuming everything we can mm -hmm. make here in the in the North America. Someday, we'll do, we'll do something in Europe, but it's right. not today. Yeah. So, at what point did you realize it was going to be a, a huge success? 
oh, I don't think I would have started if I didn't think it was going to be a huge success. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so just, the, the weird thing is, in this business, really, and in, mo- in probably most businesses, you have this vision of what it's going to be, right? And you really believe it, and that motivates you to do, go do what you're going to do. So uh, both Brian and I had this really great feeling that this was going to be a great product. And along the way, by the way, I should mention we picked up Brandon O'Brien, who's also a business partner. So there's three of us. And uh, it's a great partnership. I mean, I think everybody has a good skill set that complements one another. That's sort of important behind the scenes stuff. But um, I've seen a lot of businesses fail because they, the partners don't get along. Yeah. And people lose a lot of money and it becomes a pride issue. And it, mm-hmm. and, uh, and with the, it, so we've been, this partnership has been very good that way. Right. Same with my prior bus- business partnership. It was very good. But um, so the question about how did I know it would be a success, we probably met every quarter. Well, the first sign of success was we came to BYU. We did a taste test here, and it was awesome. We put it up against um, uh, Laura Jeffries, so Dr. Laura Jeffries. She she runs a great program. So we did a, a taste test here, blind taste test. And it, it was, uh, I think it scaled really well. It showed great results and great potential. And the thing that really, uh, that we're really excited about is, you know, we're selling fruit, right, with a little bit of chocolate. And fruit has some nutritional benefits. So if you can get something that has some nutritional benefits along with something that tastes great, mm-hmm. kind of a rare, kind of rarefied air, right? Yeah. So we felt like, okay, well, this tastes good. It's got some health benefits. Um, it's better than eating a caramel. It's better than eating a piece of chocolate, right? Mm-hmm. So we felt like, okay, well, it's, and, and it, so we proved that it tastes good. We know that it has some health benefits. It's not healthy, but it's better than the alternative, right? It's a treat. So we felt like, okay, that said to me success. Um, I love the flavor. I love what, you know, I'm, we were the inventors. Right. The three of us were inventing. And so we're like, well, you're the mother of the invention. So of course you're going to love <laughs> You love your child, right? So we thought it's going to be great. It's going to everybody's going to love it. Well, that in my experience is rarely true, right? You don't ever. No one loves it as much as you do. It seems. Yeah. Like. So, but we went up to. We had some, you know, from our business prior business experience. We had some experience with Costco. Costco, by the way, a very innovative company. Yeah. They like to be on the front end. I should have mentioned them very first. Um, so they. Uh, we went and called on them in the Northwest Division, and 22 minutes into the conversation, they were sold. We're going to buy it for our division. Oh, and wow. by the way, we told them we can do it in three months. They said I need it in six or three months. They said we need it in six weeks. Really? So you know how that goes. So I thought, well, that's an indication of success. Great. So we get it, and it works well. It's selling well. Other divisions see it. We think, oh, we're off to the races. I'm doing all the math on how big of a plant we're going to need. And it completely falls on its face in L.A. Just, like, unbelievable. Like, I couldn't believe that it wasn't selling well in L.A. Because I thought L.A. would be the perfect right. the perfect demographic for it. And then it went into Texas, and it didn't do well in Texas. And then it did okay in the Midwest, and it did okay in the Northeast. But it didn't just knock the cover off the ball. Hmm. So that went on for a year, and we were scratching our heads. And so we started meeting every quarter and saying, well, are we the only guys that like this? Or is this going to, I mean, this could fail. So mm-hmm. are we going to, you know, what's our, what's our strategy going for? Are we going to, so we, oh, we got to put more money in. Okay, so we're going to pony back up. We're going to keep going. And uh, that went on for probably a year and a half. Uh, we uh, Brian really drove the de- really drove. Let's move to grocery outside of just club. So when we started selling grocery, we st- Target was the first one to take us. January of 2019, I think, either 2019 or 2018. And uh, you know, so they say, hey, we're going to buy it, but by the way, you, you'll start delivering in June. So here is January. What do we do between January and June? We got to have some sales, right? So. Yeah. We're scrambling a little bit. We're getting the Harmons and a few other people to take it. But um, it started out slow in Target. And so, we, again, we're meeting. Well, you know, do we believe in this or not? And uh, I think the insight was the the packaging was a little bit old. So we changed, we, up, we upgraded the packaging. We spent some money on that. 
uh, the brand wasn't known. It was just an unknown brand. Who knows what it is? We tried to tell the you know the story with a picture on the front of the bag. But once we started doing some serious marketing, uh, including sampling, we did a lot of sampling. We did a lot of uh, social media. We did a lot of in-store type program. So anyway, once we started to do that and the brand name started to get known, uh, we have a great marketing group uh, that has done all kinds of wacky things, anything from Mom's Meat, which is a little bit wacky, but it worked pretty good. Um, That's just a group of 20 moms that get together and you provide product for them to taste it. They sample it and they actually, you know, rate you. Right. Yeah, We got Phenomenal ratings on that. Everything we did, we always got phenomenal ratings on taste-wise. But it wasn't selling off the shelf. So, uh, But it just started slow at Target. And it started, I think Target wants to sell four to five units per store per week. That's how you measure it in our industry. And we started out below that. We were like two units per store per week. And, and then it would go to two and a half. And then, you know, over the next month, it started to grow to three. And then it went to... Eventually, it started to just knock the. I don't, you know, we just kind of started hitting some really good. We got some really good traction, and um, we ended up at. I think we're we we topped out at like ninety five units per store per week. Wow. So it's just like unbelievable. That's right? crazy. So other stores see that, so they started to buy from us. Yeah. Companies like Hy-Vee, Wegmans, they uh, they were early on, and same thing. We just it took a while to get the brand name known, but once we got the brand name installed and people tried it and and. Uh, the repeat purchases were very high. Once we got people to try it, sample it, repeat purchase was very high. So uh, I think we kind of finally dialed the formula in to where it works now and we know how to go into a market. Mm -hmm. We know how to enter a new store. So we just got listed for the first time with um, Walgreens. We ship in in January and Publix down in uh, Florida took us and those were you know, accounts that we wanted to get into eventually. We're still trying to knock, we're still knocking on the doors of a few more yeah. that haven't taken us. <laughs> Some we've had to turn down because their slotting fees are so high up front, but oh, right. for the most part, we're getting into most stores that we go to. Right. No, it's honestly so cool to hear that, especially because I'm learning about brand, like how important a brand is and marketing and then advertising it. Right. So, and just so you know, we had a little brand study that did uh, I think we've got 0.4%, I don't know if it's unaided or aided brand awareness right now, 0.4%. So we're just scratching the surface. Yes, of what you could do. Mm-hmm. Because didn't True Fruit go quite viral on TikTok? Yep. I mean, every time people would post the dumbest things, I say dumb. <laughs> they were really interesting things, but to the normal guy like me, it wasn't that interesting. It'd be somebody going into a Costco, getting a bag, Opening it up and saying, "Look what I found," and then they would like, they would like, uh, do a little cheers. Oh, really? And you know, clink it with somebody else and eat it, and that would get like seven million views. <laughs> like, well, I don't quite know why people wanted to see that so much, but it did help. I mean, it did. Uh, you know, we started. We went into Eastern Canada with a strawberry program, and uh, wow, I mean, they they sold out overnight. I mean, it was. The people in Eastern Canada are crazy. I mean, they have, they are driven people up there. So they, yeah, they, they clued in fast and went after it. It was, it was amazing. Oh, it is. It has been so interesting to see how big of a role TikTok has played in so many brands. If there's anything that goes viral on TikTok, true through, there's loads of makeup pieces mm-hmm. that go viral. Then if you go and try and buy them, I've done this multiple times. So I'm like, I want to try that. You go in there, nine times out of ten, it's just not there because oh, it's really? sold out. Wow. Like, it's so instant. Yeah. And that is such a cool thing about TikTok. And I agree with you. There's so many videos that just make no sense, have no entertainment, but go viral because it's just trend. Mm-hmm. It's just that like everyone wants to see you doing the same thing as everyone else. So my marketing guy would be horrified at me saying what I'm saying. Because <laughs> he would say, of course they were interesting. Of course, I mean... Uh, well thought out. Anyway, they, but uh, yeah, I agree. And I don't know what the, see, the problem is, what's the next, because TikTok didn't exist, but two years ago. Mm-hmm. So what's the next TikTok? And staying up with that and staying oh, current on yeah. all that. It's, so for guys like me, that's tough. That's why we have a marketing group that has mm-hmm. like five people that are 
at least with it enough to know what's the next TikTok. Mm-hmm. So, and they're they're all, all over it. So mm-hmm. we're lucky to have that. That's cool. Did you ever figure out why it wasn't True Fruit wasn't as successful in LA, mm-hmm. or is it now just as successful there? Uh, we haven't been back in LA yet. We're just going. Okay. We'll, we'll get back in here this uh, in the the next couple of months. Um, I so raspberries aren't popular everywhere. Mm-hmm. Oddly, I thought everybody loved raspberries. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't like raspberries. So the sour and sweet combination put some people off. Mm-hmm. Some people so there's a lot of people who like sweet on sweet. So for example, we're doing a strawberry. So strawberry is a little more mild. It doesn't have quite the uh, you know, quite the punch that a raspberry does, but it's very smooth and very, you know, almost like sexy. So people like that a little bit mm-hmm. more. Uh, so we're going to go back in with strawberries and see how that goes. Mm-hmm. So I think it had a combination of brand, brand We didn't have a lot of brand uh, traction out there. It was a combination of... Uh, uh, the packaging needed to be updated, so we've updated the packaging now. Um, so I, you know, I think it was just sort of a combination of things. We just the the demographic at Costco in LA is a little different. I went down and went to about ten stores just trying to figure out what was going on, and there is a different demographic that shops the stores down there. A lot of the pe- people that shop down there are literally doing what club stores were originally designed to do, which is I'm going to buy a bunch of product and take it and resell it in my store. Mm-hmm. So I have a drug store down on Venice Beach or something, and I need I need to stock it, and I don't have, you know, it's just easier for me to come here and get pick it up and mm-hmm. go resell it. So our product wasn't really designed for that. It was really designed for consumption. So I think if we were to really hit, knock the ball out of the park in L.A., we'd have to do something that's multi-packs that's going to be resold, which we haven't done yet. So, but I think the consumption in the social media and the brand equity will carry it some. It may, it may not do as well as, say, Eastern Canada did, but it will. I think it will do well. That makes sense. Earlier you talked about it, it being so important to be um, with co-partners that work or, like, that you get along with. Correct. What do you call that? A partnership? Business partners, yeah. <laughs> but, okay. Yeah, you talked about how important it is to get on well with your business partners. What's your advice to BYU students who are looking to start a business or just looking for a business partner? What type of things do you think make a successful business partner? Oh, that's a really good question. I think there's really, I've worked with two different types of people, right? One is a prima donna that are usually pretty good. You know, they're very good at something that they do, but hard to get along with. And uh, the other kind is uh, more how can I help you type person. And they each have their skill sets, right? So I think it's a matter of what can you work with, right? What what are you able to work with? How can you uh, contribute to a partnership where pride doesn't get in the way, right? Uh, one of the things my dad always taught me was don't let pride get in your pocketbook. And it's true because if you start to act on out of ego that, hey, I, I'm right on this and my business partner's not listening to me about this. It's, it's more about how can I convince my business partner that this is the right thing to do and if I can't, it's not the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And you gotta, you gotta live with that, right? You gotta, yeah. you gotta live that. And you gotta subject your ego and you, and, but you do have to be driven, right? And the tough thing is you get two driven people working together, you're gonna have differences of opinion. Yeah. So I think we decided kind of early on if we don't, if we don't both agree, we're not going to do it. Hmm. But that doesn't mean we're not going to try to convince each convince other each to other. do it, right? Yeah. So we're going to work really hard at convincing each other, hey, it's the right thing to do. But if I can't use a good argument enough to say, hey, it's the right thing to do and this is why, then it's probably the wrong thing to do. And i got to subject my ego to say, well, I thought it was the right thing to do, but why isn't, you know, why? Yeah. And just redirect. So um, it's a really complex question. That question is a really compl- complex question, and I don't think I could answer it within a you know, right. five-minute answer, but it's a, it's an important piece to know that you have to get along with your business partner and that you have to have an agreement up front. The thing that helped us was if we don't agree, we're not going to do it. And we got to be able to, we, got, we have to be able to agree on something or it's not going to really work. No, I actually really love that. 
I was just listening to a TED talk earlier that talked about givers and takers mm -hmm. in business and just in life and how the givers always win in the end because I don't know what goes around comes around but also just I think a lot of that pride isn't there when you're a giver like seeing what you can do for someone else because sometimes when I think I'm right on something it's just really hard to just not do what I think's right but what's important with what you said is that you have to sell someone on your idea and if you can't do that then why would it even work <laughs> I, I think I mean it's simple but it's true I think and I would probably challenge you a little bit on the givers the givers I mean business is so hard especially a startup I've never done a startup before I got to tell you you have to have so much energy to push through the myriad of problems you're going to face so sometimes the givers aren't driven enough they're like uh you know everybody's right I'm wrong right and you have to be convinced enough so sometimes the guys that are so driven are really hard to get along with, but I, I can tell you that is an essential part of being in business, mm -hmm. that you have to have that drive and mm -hmm. determination. And I appreciate people that have that drive. And so, look, if, if somebody has that kind of drive, I'm going to, you know, let's try to work around that. If, you know, let's, let's find ways to make that work. But, uh, you know, being driven, I think that is, uh, that's, that is an essential part of running a small business mm -hmm. because whew, it <laughs> is, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a grind. Yeah. I should, probably should have started with this, but you did, did you do a bachelor's degree of marketing, BYU? Uh, accounting. Major accounting. in accounting, yeah, accounting. at BYU. And then you went on to Harvard. So I did public accounting for four years okay. in uh, Northern California, one, and got married in Tammy made more money in Southern California than I made in Northern California, <laughs> so I moved down and lived with her. And uh, she took care of me for a while. So she was working in, the, she was a BYU MBA. Mm -hmm. And I was just an undergrad. So anyway, she was working in banking. So I worked three years down in Southern California in accounting and then went to business school uh, back at, back in, uh, in Boston and uh, got an MBA and then came back to LA and worked in consulting for two years. And that's when, uh, from there, I moved up to here. To what would be your advice to BYU students that want to start a business? Um, you know, it's a it's a great time to start a business when you're young and you don't have a lot to lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the hard part about starting a business when you don't have anything to lose, you don't have anything to start with, right? Yeah. So you don't have anything to lose, you don't have anything to invest. So mm -hmm. it's a real it's a real challenge, right? The the balance of that. My suggestion has always been go work for somebody else, go make mistakes on their dime. Go learn how a business works from somebody else. Because even, I mean, I thought I knew a lot, right? I worked four years in accounting. Um, BYU's got a great accounting school, as you know. I'd worked, you know, I'd gone to business school with some really bright people. So I felt like I knew quite a bit. I'd gone back into consulting and saw what a lot of people did, a lot, a lot of mistakes they made in management consulting. And uh, so I thought, well, well, I'm not going to make those mistakes. But I got into business and I made those mistakes. I made mistakes like right away, mm -hmm. like right, like I missed stuff in due diligence I should have seen. Uh, there was open-ended leases that were going to expire that I didn't even see. And I had to pay, you know, I bought the business already. And I, I'd stretched to buy the business. And within a year, I had to buy out all the equipment or they were going to come take the equipment out of the factory. I'm like, how did I, am I stupid or what? How did I miss that? <laughs> anyway, so... I think learning from somebody else is really important and being humble enough and surrounding yourself with people that complement your skill set. If you don't know your own skill set, you know, you're, you're in trouble because uh, you got to know what you're good at and you got to know what you're not good at. And I knew, I knew what I wasn't good at. And if I didn't know, I was taught pretty quickly what I wasn't good at and uh, was at least, at least, um, got my ego out of the way enough to hire people that were really good at the stuff that I was bad at. We hired somebody from Hallmark that was a brilliant marketing person in our early company, a sales guy that was just a brilliant sales guy uh, in my early company, uh, you know, and then got, got together with a business partner that was fantastic. So um, super important. I think you know, I, I, I hearken back to a, a test I took once that was the fatal flaws of leadership. And the number, you know, they had like 10 things listed and they were 
you know, competence in your job and all these other things, those were the, the least likely to cause you to fail. The most likely to cause you to fail was being cold and aloof. Hmm. And if you don't know how to treat people and care about people and show them that you care, and they won't, they won't follow you. They won't do anything for you. They'll, they'll, it'll be a job for them. So I think you really do have to care somewhere in your heart about people other than yourself, care about their personal circumstances, care about what their ambitions and aspirations are, whether it's to work for you the rest of their life or work for you for two years and go on to do something else. You want to help them achieve what they're trying to do. And then, then they will, you know, they'll go through walls to, to follow you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's just, a, I, I think, a key element in mm-hmm. um, being able to, you know, start a business and run a business. Mm-hmm. So if, uh, if, you're the act, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're going to have some challenges because the smartest person in the room is always the one that's st- stepping on people and stepping on people's necks and not caring about them. So mm-hmm. be careful if you're that person. Mm-hmm. Go into a business that you can do without having to have other people help you do it. Right. And there's those businesses. I mean, there, there are those. But for me, that's what yeah. worked for me. That's such amazing advice. And especially what you said about actually showing it. Because a lot of us actually do really care, but then actually showing How do you people. show it, right? Yeah. How do you reward people who do something like do accounts payable? How do you reward somebody for that? I mean, mm-hmm. there's ways to do it, and I think there's I think it's important to do, right? Yeah, you know, it's easy to reward salespeople because it's so, you know, it's just math, right? Oh, well, you sold this much, I can, I'll pay you this much more. Mm-hmm. But for the other people who are working just as hard, it's hard to find ways to reward them and to recognize them. But, mm-hmm. you know, Sam Walton was was a genius at that. He was, he I, I, he was you know, kind of a hero of mine of how he did things. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. To finish off this podcast, we have to ask you the question we ask everyone, which is how do you personally measure success, maybe on a day-to-day basis or in your life? You know, I think the standard answer is money, but it's not. It's really not money. Um, when we sold our first business, I like to tell the story that we became financially independent. Right? I didn't need. I didn't need a job, and uh, it was a weird feeling to have. And I, I'd set my whole goal in life as a provider to be financially independent. So when we achieved that goal. I was 48 or 49, I was, I'm just under 50, and uh, I just somehow expected the angels to sing and the, <laughs> and the people to part, and I would be honored and respected and revered. Uh-huh. But I got, you know, the next morning I get out of bed, I go into the, <laughs> where all the kids are having breakfast, and I'm the same dumb old dad that I was before I was financially independent, uh-huh. right? Just like the changed in a day, <laughs> but uh, nothing changed. In, the, in my kids' eyes, it was... And Dad, you know, guess, what are you doing? Give me the syrup or whatever it is. Right? <laughs> and it was just such a wake-up call that there's really not, it's really a flimsy, wealth is flimsy, right? It's just not, it's uh, tinkling. It's not, there's no fulfillment in it. It allows you to do things. It provides a lot of opportunities. But there's not satisfaction in it. I, so I think I define success as, you know, an attitude of gratitude um, a f- sense of fulfillment, a, uh, are you, you know, are you providing for your family and others? Are you, do you have a, a, a gift of, um, you know, are you help, are you, are you helping with the resources you have? Are you are able to help, you know, others? So I, th- that's where the real, I think, uh, uh, success comes from, right? Because if you're, you can have monetary success all day long and be so unhappy, right? But if you're not, if you don't have a fulfilled life in the home and whatever work you're doing, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, you go back to all the experiences you have when you go to Africa and you see the poorest people in the world and they're freakishly happy because they don't know what they don't have and they're just happy to do what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it changes your perspective, right? You know, I mean, you, uh, so 
I think, you know, success is defined to me as really having a sense of fulfillment and providing and, uh, as, you know, monet- monetary is keeping score. You're just like, it's like you're keeping score. Okay, I can, I can win that game, <laughs> but that game's over. And then what? Then what? Right? So having a purpose, having a, the knowledge of Christ and a, a purpose in your heart, I think that's, to me, and that doesn't require money to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's so true. So much to think about. So. Is there anything else you'd like to say to the BYU business students? Uh, learn from your, you know, learn from your uh, professors and learn from your fellow students. I think I learned as much uh, in business school from the people I sat next to as I did from the professors. And I ended up being a business partner, not with the professor, but with members of the class, mem- members of my section, mm-hmm. a member of my section. And um, there's, you know, having an inquisitive mind and being inquisitive the rest of your life because the more I know, the more I learn, the more I find I don't know, mm-hmm. right? So having that, and I think BYU does a good job of instilling that in people, having this curiosity and yeah. uh, a, a desire to learn. I mean, you know, that's the whole come to learn and go forth to serve. I mean, that's the whole the whole idea. So mm-hmm. it's a, uh, a, the perspective of always wanting to learn, I think, is important. Mm-hmm. Well, there's kind of been an underlying theme in all of this that I keep hearing you say, which is basically to just be quite humble in all that you do and learning from everyone, not just in business, but in everything, always seeing other people in a divine way and in that they have something to teach you. So I'll definitely... Yeah, if you're not asking other people their opinion every day, you're making a mistake. And we'll end on that line. Thank you so much, Taz, for coming on today. It's been such a pleasure to hear on how you define success. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. And hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or SoundCloud so you never miss an episode. Be a friend and tell a friend about measuring success right. <laughs>